This video is going to be about autism diets. Are you doing it right? Are you not seeing the results that you want? How to do diet in a way that actually supports the process of turning symptoms around? Why it is that it sometimes doesn't work? And how to avoid getting too extreme so that you're too rigid, too restrictive. And by being too restrictive, you actually work against recovery and against healing and against nourishing and healing the microbiome. So let's dive into it also to avoid this sense of creating an eating disorder for the whole family because you can't eat anything and because you become afraid of food. This happens to a lot of autism families as well as a lot of autism families who experience the opposite that they really struggle to make the decision to take away foods that other children have and that they like to eat. So cookies and cakes and pizza and pasta, all those things. So by the way, my name is Ninka Bernadette Mawutan. I'm the founder of barefootautismwarriors.com. I live here in my tiny home with my two sons. And my oldest son was recovered. He lost all his symptoms between 2004 and 2008. And you can follow along for more information about that. Now, Autism diets, it's a hot topic and it's a very misunderstood topic in many cases and in many instances. My son's symptoms absolutely was, did disappear because of, partly because of what we stopped eating. But if you are not experiencing the results that you want from a gluten-free diet or a di dairy-free diet, you might say, well, I did that, I did that, it didn't help. There's probably a reason why it didn't help in most cases because gluten and dairy is not beneficial for, for basically most children on the spectrum. So gluten and dairy, just to, I'm not gonna to dive too much into that, but gluten and dairy have several issues that we wanna avoid when it comes to autism symptoms. They have an opioid effect, which makes the children either super dopey or super hyper because it actually enters into the bloodstream, especially through a leaky gut system where the body then looks at this strange, partly broken down chain of um, amino acids and it doesn't recognize it as food and it sees these opioids floating around the system and starts attacking own tissue as well. So not only do you have the opioid, which is like a narcotic effect of gluten and dairy, but you also have the immune response where the immune system just mistakes these food items as enemies. And sometimes it's so similar to own tissue that the immune system actually starts attacking its own tissue and you'll never know what part of the body that the immune system will attack and you won't necessarily see the effect in the beginning. But maybe long term, it will be skin issues, it can be gut issues, it can be degenerative issues, um, even um, breaking down the gut lining over time. So it's not just Crohn's, uh, it's not just celiac disease, it can be non-celiac reactions and intolerances. So uh, the child might uh, experience things like that seems like asthma symptoms that happened to my child, both of my children actually, and when we removed gluten and dairy, those symptoms went away and they actually didn't need asthma medication after that. Um, gluten and dairy, so dairy in particular is a highly inflammatory food, it's particularly the, the traditionally farmed dairy. And so for my children, it shows up immediately. And, I, and for me as well, it's acne or mucus or coughing or infections a couple of days later. So you no, don't necessarily experience any gut issues, but it can be any type of issues and it can be anywhere from one week after having exposed the body to this to years down the line. That's why for me, it's a safe thing is to just exclude it overall, particularly in the first years of your turnaround journey. If your gluten and dairy free diet hasn't worked, it's probably because you haven't been 100% consistent with it. 
because with gluten it's either or you cannot have just a minor tiny exposure every once in a while so if the child is out and about and you don't know what the child is eating if this child have as much as a crouton you're back to scratch when it comes to gluten it's like 100 percent you have to cut it out and for at least a year to see full effect because the first six months to 10 months the body simply gets out of an extremely stressful situation and gets into repair mode so you won't be able to see much effect of a completely dairy and gluten-free diet until you have done this 100 percent for at least a year then you got to think about glutamates and uh, people who don't see results from a gluten and dairy free diet they often need to exclude glutamates as well and glutamates are neuroexcitatory, so they will cause aggression and anger and agitation and anxiety. And glutamates are in a lot of foods that these children eat. Crisps, uh, chips, bone broth, protein powder, probiotics, all processed foods, anything that's been heated up to a high temperature, anything with MSG in it. But there's a lot of foods with a lot of high levels of glutamates naturally as well in them that you need to avoid if you want to avoid tantrums and aggression and and rigidity and agitation so if you haven't excluded glutamates that's probably why the gluten and dairy free diet doesn't work it doesn't mean that you still don't need to exclude gluten and dairy Another thing to think about are the things that have gluten in them that we think are gluten-free or have similar effects, which will be most oats, oat products, even the gluten-free ones. Um, many of the gluten-free bread and um, dairy alternatives have another problem. So then if you go gluten-free and dairy-free and you have a lot of processed gluten-free bread or you give your child almond milk for example a lot of almond milk or other plant-based milks they or you bake bread with nut butter and nut flour instead these food items are high in copper and copper have the same effect on the body as gluten and dairy so aggression, anxiety, agitation, violent behavior can be linked to copper overload based on an overdose of the, the copper rich foods that you then give your child because you think now I'm doing something healthy for my child and you don't understand why it doesn't work. Well, that might actually be because of what you, what you replace your gluten and dairy with. So think about limiting those nut and seed based products and the processed gluten and dairy free foods. So these are some of the things you need to take into consideration when it comes to doing it right. Then we have the whole issue of making this decision for your child. I have a lot of moms who feel sad about denying their children the same cookies and pizza and candy that they are handed out in school and at parties or in church or wherever that might be. And I hear moms say, well, I don't want him to feel more different. I don't want him to um, not have the same fun as other children and be more of an outsider because he's already dealing with being an outsider and being different. And I just have to say one really important thing about that. If you feel that it's, it's bad to make that decision for your child and so you let your child have those foods, like food dyes, processed food, processed foods, glutamates, gluten dairy, um, what you are actually doing is that you are impairing growth, you are limiting this child's ability to learn and take in information because you will create neuroinflammation and excitatory effects and aggression and inflammation. So this child will not be able, due to the effect of the food, will not be able to learn, take in, from, in information, process information it will limit social skills and emotional control i saw that very clearly with my child even to this day when he has gluten accidentally or by choice if he cheats with it you can determine that just by looking at him and, and monitor his behavior he is different he gets more rigid he gets uh, unpleasant to be around he regresses and so we think we are helping our children fit in by giving them the foods that 
making them fit in, but then long term damaging their ability to learn and develop social skills, learn and have emotional control and um, stop being so rigid and ritualistic, which might have given them a chance to develop healthy friendships or even have a, a partner later in life or fit into the workspace or, or have, a, have a job or take a driver's license long term. So we really got to think long term rather than short term when it comes to this. Finally, I want to touch on the eating disorder part because that's definitely a risk to become too extreme, too rigid and too restrictive with food. Many of us as moms, when we have seen our child get sick from oxalates, some another topic for another day, but some foods are rich and high in oxalates and they, that can cause bedwetting and tantrums as well. And so, and uh, the candida feeding foods that some moms exclude because they don't want this drunkenness, uh, drunk behavior that can come with candida feeding foods if a child's got candida uh, this fungus in the body that can cause strange behavioral patterns as well but if we just exclude all these foods that are high in oxalates or that might potentially feed candida i can i see moms exclude potatoes fruit berries uh, bread uh, fiber, you know, all the things like banana, healthy foods, fiber rich foods, the starchy foods that actually feed the gut and educate the gut and train the gut to crave more and more healthy foods, micronutrients. It's a really bad idea to become too restrictive and too rigid with the food. The more you exclude the macronutrients and micronutrients from the child's diet, the less the microbiome is actually able to produce the enzymes to break down those foods, which means the child's ability to deal with food gets increasingly limited. And at some point when I was recovering my child, we were avoiding potatoes, fruit, bread, uh, basically carbs. It was a, like a keto paleo diet. And it ended up being so extreme that my child couldn't handle any foods. If you did a, a food intolerance panel, which panel, which is a, it's total nonsense. Don't ever do that. It's useless. It won't tell you anything because the results are so different from day to day. But uh, it turned out my child couldn't handle any food at the end. And we all looked extremely um, unhealthy. We were too skinny. We had black circles under the eyes and skin and hair quality was not good because we did not, our microbiome was not fed all the different varieties of food that the microbiome needed in order to stay healthy. You need all types of fats, all types of fruits, all types of berries, all types of starchy vegetables. You need rice, you need potatoes, you need bananas, you need blueberries, you need apples, you need pears, you need bananas. The different types of Soldiers in the microbiome need different types of food. So don't be too restrictive. Also because we have a diet culture in society in general, and that diet culture can be rampant in the autism mom community as well, where we are super afraid of most foods. Many moms limit bread and fruit and carbs, even rice, starchy vegetables, because they think they're gonna get fat from it. Many autism moms avoid almost all these healthy, starchy um, carbs that are so important for you to have a flexible metabolism as well, to be able to shift from burning carbs to burning fats and vice versa, and uh, to feed the microbiome. We gotta be super careful not to become extreme or rigid with the food because it's it, long-term, it has a negative effect on your metabolism. It makes it harder and harder for you to actually metabolize and deal with carbs. It makes it difficult for you to have an optimal microbiome. And it's really difficult for you to get your child the nutrients that it needs to grow and to have a strong immune system, a, a stable appetite. And if we exclude all these things, the cravings for the junky foods or the, the, the processed foods will be that much higher. 
The final point I want to make is that if your child's a picky eater, it has to do often with lack of, of a sink, sink deficiency, lack of leadership for us as moms, where we struggle to set boundaries and be good examples by lived experience. And we, we, we have a tough time setting boundaries and we don't like when our children get mad at us and we don't like when they get sad about things, but it is also part of life. We need to set those boundaries and we need to be comfortable with anger. We need to be comfortable with making unpopular decisions because if we want our children to fit in and we don't want to make those unpopular decisions, long term we create a problem for our children. Not only do they become really spoiled and they think that they are the leaders in the family, which is super stressful for children, but also we actually accidentally and unconsciously create more health problems, more mental problems, more social problems and more more uh, uh, family dynamic problems long term. So I hope this was useful. And if you have any questions or comments, please post them below and I'll be happy to get into a, a conversation with you, whether you agree with me or not. Just want to say again, I'm the founder of Barefoot Autism Warriors. I uh, am taking this cabin off grid with my children. He's actually, my son is building outside. And I provide videos with content that has to do with how I turned my son's symptoms around between 2004 and 2008. And I'm helping moms all over the world do the same every single day. So I hope to see you again soon. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this video.